We just had technical problems there, so thanks for coming back to us. We're back on our brood inspection. And what we're doing today is spring management. More important than ever, New South Wales, to do your spring management, to limit your hive from swarming. So we don't spread varroa mites. They're trying to get on top of it, 43 infestations so far all linked to the movement of a commercial apiary here in New South Wales. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we can get on top of it. But if all of us can limit our hives from swarming, that will help. So, we've got our smoker going, blowing nice cool smoke here. And Lainey is joining us, who is a new team member to our hive. She's never done any uh, beekeeping inside the hive before so she'll be asking some questions and if you've got questions put it in the comments below okay so once you've got your smoker going with nice smoke like that then there we go just takes a while to get going sometimes what we can do and you can do this is blow some smoke in these areas where we want to work so we're going to start with this edge frame. So I'm looking down and going, which one's easiest to pull out? We want a nice straight looking one. We are using naturally drawn comb here. So we want to uh, find one that's not bumpy and lumpy and going to bump into another frame. So I'm gonna put the smoker in front of the hive here, just so any wafts of it will, um, see I might just hang on to it while you do this. Now, what I want you to do with your hive tool is, is, first of all, the chisel end down between the end bars. So you've got this frame, then this frame, and a little gap between them. So put the hive tool in there and just lever it over slightly. If you go crossways first, you're much less likely to pull out the nails, or in this case, the staples holding the frame together. Now we put the curved end underneath the end bar like that. And yep, perfect and then roll it around and that will lift it up. Now with your other hand, grab the other end of the frame. This end over here, mm. that's it. And I'll just hold this for a second. You can get your hand under that end rather than the tool if you like. That's it. Great, your first frame you're pulling out of the beehive. It's a lot heavier than I anticipated. Yes, well this frame is full of honey. You'll get light ones and heavy ones, but the honey ones can be uh, up to three kilograms of weight. So what we're seeing here is this glistening new nectar, which is a really good sign, showing that the hive is bringing in new nectar. So that is good. The bees will start building up and I'll start storing honey in the flow box at the top. What we're also seeing is this frame has been used for brood a lot of times. See how dark the wax is compared to the hive we had last week, which had really bright, uh, fresh looking wax. So when they've used it a lot, the silk cocoons and the footprints of the bees build up and it goes dark like this. So a good idea to cycle these out to the edge, which has already been done in this hive. Um, a few months back, we cycled these ones from the center to the edge. And what's happened is all of the brood has emerged from the cells and they've replaced it with honey. And now we can take this right out of the hive and, and actually cut the uh, comb out of it and put it back in towards the center. Is what? that edible, the, the brown, the, all of that? It is, it is, certainly. It's, you're just chewing on more chewy wax in a way. So over here, look, that looks beautiful and edible. There's no honey in that bit, so you wouldn't bother. But here, we can enjoy getting some honey. You could either crush and strain the honey, or you could just uh, cut bits off and enjoy the difference between really dark comb and light comb and, and just the differences in beekeeping. So I can see the bees are a little bit agitated. I'm going to uh, blow a bit more smoke into the hive. I'm gonna, can I ask a question about the smoker? Yep. Have you done it without the smoker and it's, you get different results? Yes, so the smoker definitely has a calming effect. Now, you will get hives and some hives, we even go as far as no smoke and no suit. But genetics play the biggest key there, so if you've got bees that are a little bit agitated like this, you definitely want to get your smoker out, calm them down. Most of the time we are using a bit of smoke in the hive. And how do you tell the difference between an agitated bee and, I mean it sounds like they're a little bit miffed, but 
what's the real difference? How can you tell the difference between an agitated bee and a kind of a relaxed one? So, so every now and then we're getting ones that buzz erratically and start going for your veil or your, or your suit, like this one here. Yeah. So that's a bee, just, uh, it's a guard bee trying to scare me away. Now, at some point, if they decide to attack, I guess, then they'll, they'll probably go for my arm or they'll go for the suit and dig their stinger in. But they're not doing that. They're just more doing a warning, which is nicer of them. Okay. So you, you can rest that on here for the moment and we can just have a look at another frame. On here? Yep. So you're resting it down in between with the tags just on the lumps there. So these are a dual purpose thing. That's it. So you can fit three frames across here, which is really nice. Even one's handy because now you can go sideways inside. Now this smoker keeps going out. So I'll let you, uh, yeah, you can start moving that one across ways by with the chisel end. And I'll relight this smoker while you're doing that. Okay, pine needles must be a bit damp after the rain, they're uh, not performing as normal. We'll see how we go. So what are we seeing on that one? We've got honey up here, which has been in there for a while because the footprints have built up on it and it's got darker capping compared to this little bit on the edge, which is lighter, which got filled in later. And they also put that at a different height. Depending on the honey flow, they'll draw it out further or less. And does this look different in, in spring or summer, the, 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 the colour? Have they been feeding on this? Is that why it looks so dark? I've... So it's more if it's new wax or old wax. So this wax has been used many, many times and the capping has been there for a long time. So if in spring you typically do get a lot of new wax made because there's an abundance of nectar for them to do that with and you'll see sort of white or bright yellow, bright white or yellow as new wax. But if they're recycling wax, it'll be brown or, or dark in colour. Recycling wax from Silly question, hive. but why do they recycle wax when they're so good at making it? Ah, because they can, because it uses seven kilograms of honey to make a kilogram of wax. So it's more efficient to reuse, mm. just like humans need to do more. So, can I see the other side? No. Yeah, we can have a look at the other side now. Oh, it's be How so, yep, yeah, that's it. You can just rest it there. Now, what you're doing is great because you're letting it hang. Now, sometimes naturally drawn comb will fall out if you tip it completely on its side because it doesn't have the wire reinforcing of conventional wax and wire frames. I'm also looking for queen cells down here, which are peanut looking thing. I thought there might have been one there because they kind of look like that but that's just comb. Because queen cells is another bit of spring management. If you notice them and you've got a good laying queen, you might want to knock them off to uh, reduce the chances of them swarming. Okay, good. So there's two frames we can cycle right out of the hive. But, so let's just put that one next to this one. And now let's, uh, have a look further into the brood nest and just check that we have indeed got brood and a laying queen. So that's the next thing to do. So I'm going to put a little bit of smoke here, like that. With your chisel tool, let's move these two apart now. Yeah. That one there. Good. Great. And now you can come up with this frame. That's it. 
That's it. Well done. You got the hang of this. Away you go. Well done, Laney. First time beekeeper here. Beautiful. Nice and slow when you come up. So what we're seeing on this frame is quite a few different things. Let's have a look at this. And this feels a lot lighter. It is. It hasn't got much honey. It's got patchy brood. Now straight away when I see patchy brood, I start looking for any sunken dark cappings, just in case uh, you know, with piercings in it, just in case there's AFB around. We're always on the lookout for AFB or EFB in case it's here. Now, what's that cedar? Uh, American fowl brood or European fowl brood. Okay. I'm glad we don't have an Australian fowl brood, but it was just a naming. <laughs> I don't think it necessarily originated there, but it was named there. Okay. So, what we're going to do is just have a close look at this comb. And to do that, we might just shake the bees off like this. So, to get bees off a frame, you do a sharp movement. All the rest of the movements in beekeeping are quite slow and gentle, but to get bees off, I'm just going to shake. Ready? So, that's got the bees off this section. Now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this going, is there any sunken dark cappings? I'm not seeing that. It, it just is an old frame. And next I'm having a look down the cells to see what's going on. And what I'm seeing is fresh new larvae that are probably only about three days old, all in this section. And you can see it down there like a little crescent moon surrounded in mother's milk. Or it, it's, uh, it, it's kind of what the bees excrete, which is called royal jelly. So they excrete royal jelly, which is mother's milk to bees, and they feed it to the very young larvae. And if they feed it in the first three days and then swap to pollen, it'll be a worker bee. Through epigenetics, the pollen, the proteins in the pollen actually switch it from being a queen bee to a worker. But if it gets fed royal jelly for its entire uh, gestation, it will turn into a queen. So that way the hive can choose whether a bee becomes a queen or not. And I'm seeing eggs in this section. It's going to be hard to see down there. Perhaps if I put it in the shade, sometimes it'll be slightly easier to get right down in this section here and look for those uh, baby grubs down the bottom of the cells. You can just see the glint there of the royal jelly in the bottom. So you wouldn't cut that out because... Definitely not, no. because we want to keep that in the hive for the bees to use. So that's great. So we'll keep looking through the hive, just looking for any signs of disease issues. We will be doing um, some more stuff specifically to, for Varroa next week with Sugar Shake and uh, Sticky Boards as well. So tune in next week for that. This week we're still focusing on our swarm prevention. Thank you. And we can pull another frame up like this and just have a look what's on it. That's a popular one. Popular frame, well done. So you're already getting your eye in. What do you, what do you see here in this section? Oh, what do you see there? Queen bee. Oh. There we go. It's just, um, it's a bit camera shy, this queen. She's ducked around the other side. Should I smoke a bit? No, you can just let her go. Where did she go? There she is. She's not liking the sun, I think. She's going back around to your side now. So she should appear about here. have a look. Just trying to find her again. Camera shy. It'd be nice to get a good shot of the queen running around. But she was moving fast. Often they're a lot slower and they're going about their business laying and you can tune right in on them. This time she was in a hurry. Didn't really like the show and tell. Is that why there was so many bees on this one? Because the queen was there? Um, possibly, but not necessarily. 
Okay, she might have just run right off this frame then and back into the hive. There she is, actually. She's really camera shy today. There, right in front of my finger. And now she's <laughs> there. She's on the, going around the end bar here. She is very twitchy. And she is there. So you can see how she's longer with bigger legs. Her wings come just over halfway down her body. Compare that to the workers and they're quite different. It takes a while to dial your eyes in. Worth getting a book by Hilary Kearney called Queen Spotting to help you tune in on what a queen looks like. Here, yeah, that's great. Because that's got the queen on it, I don't really want to leave it outside the hive in case she falls off, because I want her to stay in the hive. When she's in egg laying mode, she might not get back to the hive again if she's orphaned from the hive. So I'm gonna put that right back in. Any questions, put them in the comments below. We'll get to answering those. First time beekeeper here, Lainey's been doing a great job pulling out these frames, having a look in at the world of bees. And what we're going to be doing is cutting out some of this old comb that we've already pulled out, putting the frames back in towards the centre, giving them some fresh real estate for spring, and that will limit their swarming behaviour. Because the primary trigger for swarming is nowhere for the queen to lay eggs. So if you give them fresh real estate to lay eggs in, then away they go and much less likely to so swarm. I have a question. So we're technically still in winter, but it's a gorgeous day today. Would you be doing this if it was a cold day? You can hear, we don't really get a winter as far as European honeybees are concerned. Winter to them is snow. And so we can beekeep all year round. If it was really cold, especially windy, rainy day, best off waiting for a nice sunny warm day like this. This is ideal for bees. Warm, not too much wind. The bees, a lot of them are out foraging, so there's less here uh, in the hive while we do our brood inspection. Okay, so I might show you how to just cut the comb right out of this uh, frame here so we can put them back in. Any questions coming through, Trace? Yeah, thanks, Seed, and great having Lainey. We always love a new beekeeper on Facebook Live. Lainey, you're doing a great job. Don't, don't burn yourself with that smoker there, love. <laughs> hey, look, question from Matthew coming in. Um, I imagine it must be in Australia, prepping for next month, hopefully for spring. And just wondering, when we're doing our splits, do we often, do we let them raise their own queen or do we order them in every now and then? He's a bit worried about the temper of his hive if he raises one. So if you do want nice gentle genetics, then good idea, order in a queen from a queen breeder. That way you'll get new genetics and you can ask for nice, gentle, productive, ideally, uh, hygienic as well genetics for your queen. If you um, just split it'll be a bit of a wild card if you let them naturally raise their own queen. They might, uh, she might mate with rascal drones from down the road and you get some uh, you know perhaps more aggression. So it really does make a difference. Some, some uh, hives as we we're talking about earlier are so calm you don't even need a smoker or a suit but some are really quite wild. This one's in between. They're hassling me a little bit, but they're generally putting up with us taking their hive apart, which is amazing really when you think about it. We're literally taking their hive apart and they're going, oh yeah, that's okay, I guess. <laughs> so what we're gonna do now is shake the bees off this and then we're going to brush the bees off if we can find a bit of foliage to use as a bee brush. Okay, shake, shake. So that gets most of the bees off. And then what we're gonna do is just brush the rest of them off. Um, yeah, that'll, that'll do. So I generally just use a bit of foliage so it's disposable and you're not moving pathogens from one hive to the next, but it is popular to use a bee brush, which you can buy. And uh, you just need to make sure you're sterilizing that bee brush then. Okay, now we're gonna come over here 
and we just need that knife from over there Laney and what we're going to do is cut the comb right out here and this has some pollen on it which is pretty have a look at the colors of pollen there isn't that beautiful it's got a whole lot of earthy tones with oranges and beige and white and that'll be really interesting to taste as well so we're getting a few bees around here so we might have to take this away you don't want to leave comb out for bees to feed on or you'll be encouraging robbing and then you're in a world of trouble with bees stealing honey from hives okay so what we're going to do is just simply slice along the edge this doesn't have any wire foundation any any wire or wax or plastic foundation so what we can do is simply slice right down this comb guard here like this and that will just drop right off we can take that back to our office and enjoy the flavors of the comb okay now this can go straight back in but before we do that what we might do is grab another one so we'll be doing two fresh frames today so again we're shaking the bees off and then brushing off the last ones that's it how do you stop this hive brood from going into all the others like who does who does that do they go into each other hives they do a little bit it's called drift so bees will drift from one hive to the next but ideally you're trying to get them not to do that but really if you want no drift at all you'll need to spread your hives 10 meters apart because bees do gps locate to that spot so if you move that hive away you'll notice so many bees coming back to that original position where the hive was because they really lock onto it however when bees come back with almost their body weight in nectar and pollen and it's a little bit windy they might get blown down the row a bit and go this will do i don't care anymore and they'll just end up in this hive down here and that's called drift so we're cutting this off again taking some comb back notice we've got a couple of bees on here to flick off again we'll be taking this comb inside shortly so that we don't get any bees uh, foraging on the comb because we don't want to spread pathogens from one hive to the next Okay, so we're just cutting down that comb guide, and there we have it. How many months is that worth of, of work? Uh, well, that one's been in there a while, but bees, when they get going, could draw out that comb and fill it with honey in a day if the nectar is around and the hive's strong. In fact, I've seen in just a couple of days all of the frames drawn out from a swish, fresh swarm, and that's quite common so it's amazing how quick they can go when they have the resources to do so okay these are going back in now it's good to put them towards the center rather than on the edge but what we're also going to do is put them between two other frames to make it more likely that they draw straight down when you're just starting with naturally drawn you've got nothing to guide them sometimes they'll go crossways but because these are already established, we've got the other frames to help guide them. So we're gonna do what's called checkerboarding where we will put it in between two others that are already drawn. You could hold that for one sec. I'll see if smoke is still going, yep. Okay. So I'm just adding a bit of smoke to clear them out of the way of where we want to work. And then, oh, there we go. One did sting me, I just put my hand on a bee. So if you have a look here, there's a little stinger and I'm just going to go crossways with the hive tool to get that stinger out. There we go. So wear your gloves if you're new to beekeeping. Some people also have allergic reactions like people do to peanuts and things called anaphylaxis. So it'd uh, be a good idea to um, make sure that's not you and there's EpiPens and things that you should carry as a beekeeper just in case somebody near you has a reaction to a bee sting. Okay, the frames now, I think what we're gonna do is move this across. Bees are getting a little bit, Feisty. a little bit grumpy as we were talking can about a bee earlier. Sting more yep. than once? Uh, they can if the stinger doesn't stay in, but generally not. The worker bees have a barbed stinger that stays in like you saw. So that bee will die that actually stung me. 
So they sacrifice themselves for the, for the good of the hive. So we're going across and we might go across one more just to put that further in so it's more likely to be used for brood. They tend to, tend to use um, the edge frames as honey storage and the centre ones more so for brood. Okay. There we go. How many times do you think you've been stung in your life? Oh, once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, plenty of times. So um, I guess the waves where I won't get stung for a very long time and then I'll get very complacent and I'll stick my hand on a bee or I'll do something silly or I'll be trying to impress somebody or something, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> then you get stung. So that's a fresh one. You can go back in and we'll put another one in between these two. So we'll, we'll keep two, um, two together in the centre. Uh, like this. But yeah, it depends on your tolerance to stings really. Pete, um, who you've seen on Facebook Live, Peter Wilkins, he um, doesn't wear bee suits almost ever, only for hives really grumpy, but he's got a high tolerance to bee stings, so he doesn't really mind. So it's really up to you, but as a new beekeeper, definitely, definitely wear your suit and gloves and get your smoker out. So we're pushing that down now like this and they'll quickly because the resources are coming in now they'll draw a fresh comb there i just noticed something in between these two frames there's one's got its head stuck there's tiny little sorry about that lift yep. that back up again there we go well done okay so in between these two frames if you have a look we've got comb touching comb now that's just a little strip right at the top, a little strip right at the top, which uh, you don't want comb touching. And I'm just gonna knock off the comb on this side so that we don't have touching comb. Otherwise the hive beetles can, can actually lay there, which isn't good. And I'm actually gonna take off the lump on the other side too. So hopefully they'll put it back a little more uh, square when they um, draw it out again. Okay, so that's it. We've done some spring management. We, uh, it would have been good to go through all the frames, actually check for pests and disease and also look for uh, any queen cells and knock them off. Today, uh, this hive's a little bit annoyed. We might put it back together now and come back on another day. Any more questions? Yes, yeah, see, look, just actually on what you were just doing there with that cross comb, um, um, I th the name Inter Alias opened their hive recently and it was a nice sunny day, first time all winter. But they were surprised to find um, quite a bit of cross comb and propolis gumming everything up. It was pretty hard to dislodge the frames. So just wondering what sort of clean up is needed. So it really depends, like we could go through, it, tip, commercial beekeepers will knock all of this wax off the top of the frame, so they use a lot of smoke and they'll just scrape along, smash all the wax off the top, keep it clean and neat. Some people prefer just to leave it there because the bees will use that when they need to, to, to recycle that wax. It, it's up to you really, whether you want to keep it really clean. But tips for avoiding cross comb are put any space in the hive on the edges, which is just what you saw me doing before. Where I was leaving across this frame, levering across this frame. And that's important because bees have a really specific spacing. The other one is, as they're drawing it for the first time, if you're starting with a fresh box of naturally drawn comb, check frequently, knock them back in line if, the, if they start going wonky. And once you get straight frames, they'll follow suit after that. So if you've got really wonky stuff where there's brood comb going crossways, there's brood in it, you might need to cut those bits out and use rubber bands to hold them into the frames. If you've got honey on the edge, which is all wonky, you can simply just take it away and let them start again, like we just did with two of the frames and and hopefully they'll draw it nice and straight next time or you can get out your wax and wire foundation and put foundation sheets in that's very common in beekeeping fantastic um when you were looking before cedar for that for something to brush off the the frames with uh, tidal bees from the surf coast down in Victoria said the youngest beekeeper discovered that cockatoo feathers make a great bee brush oh very nice yeah. feathers are great yes Cockatoo feathers. Cockatoo. Be nice to get a, a nice big black cockatoo feather. 
<laughs> okay. Fantastic. So it's a question coming in, and it's actually a question we get quite a bit from customer support. Um, it's from someone, um, DS is their name, and they're just saying that obviously their hive, I'm imagining they're talking about the western red cedar because the aracaria is usually pretty standard. Um, just notice that the timber comes in all different colours, and it's a good thing to explain that because I think some people get the lighter colour and they think it's not the western red cedar. Um, just all the different variants and colours that actually come from our western red cedar that we use in our hives. Yes, so the cedar is very different to the aracaria. We only have two types of wood. The aracaria is really dense and heavy, so you'll know that, the difference. Whereas the cedar, can anything from a dark chocolate brown right through to a very blonde, and that's just the variation in cedar wood. It depends on the age of the tree and the tree itself. So the uh, with the cedar, it has all of these beautiful variations. I love it when you get a really brown panel here and a light one here and so on. But it is confusing uh, for customers. So it's just something that you'd expect with uh, cedar wood. Okay, I'm going to put the top box back on now. I'm gonna seize the opportunity. If you could smoke around the rim here just to get any bees away. And the top box I cracked off earlier doesn't really have much honey in it. It's quite light. So we're going to seize an opportune moment just to drop this on. That's good there, thank you. And now we have our top box on. And all we need to do is put the roof back on and the covers back on. And we've done our spring management for this hive, helping limit the swarming. It's really slightly early to be doing it here, but it's better to be early than late because you don't want to get into the situation where your bees are swarming away, especially here in New South Wales where we're trying to control the varroa mite. Taking a split is my favourite method of swarm prevention where you take half the frames out of this one and put it into the next one. They're very unlikely to swarm after that because they've got so much new space and you get another hive out of it, which if you don't want one, somebody else surely will. Any more questions? Yeah, Cedar, um, Richard just, obviously that the cross comb people are a little bit um, interested in that. He just noticed that you reached in and just sort of pushed it closer together rather than taking it out and splitting it. He just wanted to check that that was right. You literally just pushed it over. So what I was doing was not actually um, bending the comb back in to straight in line. If you've got a frame here like this, oh, there was a, uh, Oh, we, can, we can show you actually on this frame over here. So if you come over here, that was in the frame, like that, and all I was doing is there was some protruding lumps and I was cutting it off like, the, like this with the hive tool, just hoping that next time they'll cap it a bit closer in so it doesn't protrude out into the other frame. It's just a way of straightening it up. Now that's different to controlling cross, cross comb where let's say if you had a bent bit like that, that was kind of bending out onto another frame, you could just chop that off and actually push it back into line with your hive tool like that. And that'll help straighten them up and see how those uh, cells there have all gone wonky. They'll, they'll chew them back and straighten them out, connect them to the edges and the top and away you go. So it's a good idea to get in there early. As said, we've got to take this away now because we don't want any bees getting into a mood of taking honey rather than going to the flowers. We want to limit those robbing tendencies because we don't want pathogens to spread from one hive to the next. Now we've just got a few curious bees from this hive. We're not seeing a whole pile of bees coming yet, but if it was left here too long, we would. All right. Okay, time Cedar. for one more question. Yeah, great. Look, there's a few coming in, but Cedar Daniel was just asking, he's from Texas, loves his flow hive, but just running, do we ever run two brood boxes? We do sometimes, but generally I don't run two brood boxes simply because it's easier to look through one brood box than two when you're doing your spring management and so on. So beekeeping to me is easier in this configuration because you've only got one box to lift off, one box to look through. 
Now people that live in a climate where there's long cold winters will often choose to run a little bit bigger hives. That way they're more likely to get some good honey stores to last them through a long winter. So places like that might run two brood boxes and they'll be storing quite a lot of honey on the edges or they might run two supers or three supers. In conventional beekeeping people sometimes run five, six, seven supers high. Now with flow hive beekeeping it's a bit different. Instead of storing honey on the hive and harvesting it all at the end of the season, you can come along and harvest honey as you go. So instead of having to look after all of those extra boxes and buy all those extra boxes, you're storing honey in jars on the shelf rather than in boxes on the hive. So a little bit different mentality there when you're choosing the size of your hives. I prefer to take a split then add more boxes. But in spring, you might decide just to add more, another brood box instead of taking a split. It's another really valid option that will really reduce the swarming tendencies of your hive is to add a whole nother brood box in here. Great, okay. so you've got time for another one? Yeah, one more, one more. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rob's wondering, do we do anything with the propolis? And if so, what? So the propolis you'll see building up around the edge of the hive where they're joining all the, all the bits together. Now, the only thing I really do with it is scrape it off every now and then and have a chew on it. It's good for um, if you've got a cold or something like that. To, uh, it's full of antibacterial properties and resins from the trees and so on. So it can be a really good thing. Lots of medicines get made out of propolis. So it is something you can, you can use, but we don't specifically collect it like we do the honey. If you do want to collect propolis for medicinal purposes, you can get what's called a propolis mat, which is basically a piece of gauze that you put in the hive and the bees will, uh, will uh, fill in all the little holes and then you can go and get the propolis off that propolis mat um, later. So if you want to collect propolis, there's things called propolis mats. Thank you very much for tuning in. A reminder, you cannot move a hive in New South Wales here in Australia to limit the spread of Varroa. We can harvest honey, we can do our brood inspections. You are encouraged to get in there, do your spring management to limit swarming so that we're less likely to get spread if the mites have broken the control zones they've put in. Thank you very much for watching. Let us know what you'd like us to cover in future live streams. Tune in next week, we'll be covering sugar shake and sticky mats in the hive for detecting varroa. Same time next week. <laughs>